Matt, welcome back to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I hope you're doing well. Hey, doing well. Enjoy that 80 degrees because we had that two days ago in Missouri and now it's 50. So enjoy it while you can. Get outside. Yeah, absolutely. I think we got a little colder front. Going to be in the 60s tomorrow and Sunday. and then. Uh, but, but see, Nick Saban has planned this, Matt. I, I'm not sure if you realize, but tomorrow – there's 84 and five star kids that are coming to Tuscaloosa for Junior Day. So Nick Saban has controlled the weather here like he controls everything else. He's rolled out the uh, the 80 degree day just where these recruits are arriving. So it's it's part of the plan. All part of the process, right? Of right, course. right, right. Uh, hey, Matt, I, I want to spend a little time talking about the NFL draft, but knowing the way that you know the NFL, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts uh, about Brian Dable. Uh, coming down from New England, he was part of the tight ends, been a coordinator, a couple of different spots in the NFL. He's going to be the new OC here at Alabama. Uh, any thoughts of, uh, about the uh, the new hire here in Tuscaloosa? No, it's a great hire, and it's like a testament to Nick Saban that you can go from Lane Kiffin to Steve Sarkeesian to Brian Dable. And like only at Alabama is the offensive coordinator position an upgrade from the NFL. So it, Dable is highly respected. Um, like you said, he's you know been a tight ends coach up there in New England. So I've always uh, looked to tight end coaches as great guys to advance because you have to know the run game, you have to know the pass game, you have to know the blocking scheme. So you you really become such a big part of the entire offense that way. So I think it's a great hire. Um, I was not a huge fan of either Lane Kiffin or Steve Sarkeesian just as human beings. And so you're getting an upgrade in that department for sure. Wow, that's a big comment. Matt Miller right here from BleacherReport.com as we move forward. Matt, how much does the new current schemes in college football make your job more difficult? And what I'm talking about, these zone reads, the type of offensive lineman, the way they play, uh, the way that we've moved this offense, how much does that make your job more difficult? Well, it's getting easier now because, you know, we're, we've been in it for about 10 years with, uh, you know, what well, used to be the, the read option, you know, way back in the, the you know, Vince Young, Texas days, but now a lot of these elements are starting to translate to the NFL. You know, if you watched the Super Bowl, you saw all shotgun. There was some run pass option in there. A lot of sprint out, stuff, especially with that Atlanta Falcons offense, and a ton of zone run game. So some of those elements are becoming easier to translate. The hard part for me is, you know, quarterbacks in college, you know, they get to the line of scrimmage, and they look to the sideline, and they look for those whiteboards to tell them what to do. And for so the adjustment, you can't do that in the NFL. You know, Tom Brady gets to the line of scrimmage, and sure, he's got Josh McDaniels in his headset for a little bit, but a lot of that he has to figure out on his own. So that's that's the hard part. You know, when I'm watching Jalen Hurts, it's over the next you know two years, and I'll be studying him. Is so much of it will be okay. What can he do from a mental standpoint as far as making progression? Does he get to his second and third read? And with the spread offense, there's not as much of that. You know, it's a lot of half field reads, a lot of you know, I'm going to read the corner if he bails. We're going to throw this tunnel screen. If he plays it up, we're going to throw a slug over the top. So, so much of it's predetermined, which makes my job a little bit harder as far as assessing what quarterbacks are able to read and recognize and how they're able to kind of flow within the offense that way. How much will NFL GMs and scouts take into consideration for Ardarius Stewart and O.J. Howard that they had a freshman quarterback in Tuscaloosa that couldn't get them the football as much as they would have probably liked? Well, I think with OJ, like you evaluate him as an athlete, you know, like first and foremost, and he's very special in that department. And so then you you get to the things, you know, production. I actually thought he had a pretty good year this past year in terms of it, just his numbers. But you definitely account for the fact that he wasn't featured in that offense, and that's okay. That doesn't hurt his draft stock um, because you you build in the potential. And what we've seen him do when he is featured, he's consistently made plays and. One of my favorite things about O.J. Howard is how good he is as a blocker. Like, what he brings to the table as a run blocker, he's the best run blocking tight end I've graded this year. Um, and, and I would safely say he would have been the best run blocking tight end last year as well. So just the development of him as a player from where he was, you know, when he got to Alabama and where he is now leaving as a senior, super accomplished player, a, a three-down threat. You know, he you can flex him out. You can play him in line. So he's you know, a rare prospect because so many of these tight ends coming out nowadays never put their hand in the dirt. They don't run block a whole lot. You know, like Evan Ingram and Ole Miss, he's a glorified receiver. But with O.J. Howard, you're getting a guy who you could plug him into any offensive system and know he's going to work. So that adds a lot of value to him just because of how thorough he is as a player. 
Matt, when you look at this draft, uh, regardless of need, not looking at need, who do you think is the best player in this upcoming NFL draft? Well, I, I'm still along with Miles Garrett. Uh, just what he does from an athletic standpoint, and I know you guys have seen him the last two years. Um, you know, Cam Robinson probably played him as well as anyone, and, and this year Miles was hurt with the ankle injury for that game. But, you know, the length, the speed, the the ability to bend his hips and, you know, to, to adjust his body, just all the flexibility and agility that you see from him is rare for a 275-pound guy. Like, he plays the run well. He's smart. Uh, he's able to make an impact when double-teamed. I've seen him make impacts when triple-teamed. So he is a really just a threat. You know, he's up there with guys like Jadevian Clowney, Joey Bosa, as like those true 4-3 defensive ends, you know, guys who can really – anchor on the edge, but also can get into the backfield and make plays. Like He's that type of prospect, but arguably a better athlete than either one of those guys was. Let's go to Reuben Foster for a couple of minutes and look at him. And we were making the statement before you came on uh, that he may be one of the top five linebackers that's ever played in Tuscaloosa. Uh, when you look at Reuben Foster, what do you see? I, uh, an athlete. Like, he is – that's what's underrated about Reuben Foster is his range. Like, he flies all over that field, and – and I'll, I'll go with you on this. I, he's the best Alabama linebacker I've ever studied. And that goes back to, you know, C.J. Mosley and uh, Reggie Ragland and, and all the great inside linebackers that have been there uh, in the six years I've been doing this job. Like, he is the best because of his range, uh, what he does as you know, he can rush the quarterback. He can be a blitzer. He can drop in coverage. He's such a threat against the run. And, and we've seen him do it, you know, for three years now. He can spy mobile quarterbacks. So he's such a threat. And I, I do think he's one of the five or you know, four or five best players in this class. Even with the rotator cuff injury, uh, I still think that he's just a tremendous player. Now, off the field, you're getting a leader. Like, when I first started asking teams about Ruben Foster, I had a team tell me, like, he is a true alpha dog. Like, he walks in the room, and it's his room. And that's what teams want at that middle linebacker position especially. But you look at a team like San Francisco right now where you have a leadership void and you need just some hard-nosed, kind of tough football players, and Ruben Foster fits that mold. So in my mock draft that came out this morning, I had Ruben Foster going to San Francisco at two just because of all the tools he brings to the table, but also the type of person and leader that you're getting in your locker room. So so you think he could go as early as number two? I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I, I wrote this morning. I've talked to a lot of teams over the past few weeks. Every team I've talked to has him in the top five. So. You know, we could see teams panic and reach for quarterbacks and that would push him down a little bit. But if we're talking true best player available, then I think he does go in the top three or four picks just because of how great he is on and off the field. There, there aren't any questions about him. And you get to the quarterbacks, and you know, we could spend three hours talking about all the question marks with the quarterback class this year. So inside linebackers traditionally don't go that early. So you know, safety don't really go that early, but... This is kind of a weird year because there's not that consensus top quarterback. Let me ask you about Cam Robinson. Uh, at times, mentally, made a lot of mistakes here. I think he was called for about eight to ten penalties. Uh, your thoughts on Cam Cam Robinson? And there are times he looks like a top ten pick. It's just all those other times that scare me. Um, so not only is he mentally inconsistent, but his fundamentals and technique are. The one thing I love about him is, I always thought he played his best football against the best opponent. So you watch him play Miles Garrett, and he shows up. You watch him play LSU, he shows up. Like, but you, you know, you watch him play one of these, you know, a team that's maybe not as much of a threat to him, and it looks like he's just kind of, you know, coasting through the game. So I, that's one of my biggest concerns for him. And and I actually thought the Clemson game, he kind of got beat up uh, by by ninety nine, uh, the young kid Farrell, just because he was able to match length and speed with him. So I think Cam is. You know, he's huge, he's strong, he's a very good athlete, but someone's going to have to coach him up and, and, you know, light a fire under him a little bit. But if that can happen, I think he could be a left tackle in the NFL. Now, he needs to probably get, uh, I don't know if you can improve his hip flexibility and how quick his feet are, but those are the two biggest questions I have outside of the kind of work ethic and inconsistencies that you see. Obviously, there's some off-field stuff that kind of has to be dug into and researched a little bit, but... I think when it's all said and done, he's still a first-round pick, and it's a good chance he's a top-20 pick just because, like the quarterback class, there's, there's a big gap in the offensive tackle class this year where there's not that go-to guy this year. You know, last year, we knew it was going to be Lamey Tunsil and Ronnie Stanley and Jack Conklin and Taylor Decker. This year, like, 
there aren't very many people who can agree on who the top offensive tackle even is. Matt, this is probably going to sound like the biggest Homer question that you've ever been asked. It'll be my final question, so if you get mad at me, uh, we won't have to talk much further. But uh, when you look at playing under the Nick Saban system, do you get points for that? When you evaluate characteristics and makeup, do you get points for playing under what we call the 33rd NFL organization here in Tuscaloosa? Well, it works both ways, and I don't think that's a homework question. I think it's a fair question. So it works both ways because, like, when I evaluate this year's class, I know that Jonathan Allen and Ruben Foster and Cam Robinson and O.J. Howard, they're going to know how to practice. Um, I've heard stories about guys going from Alabama to the Cleveland Browns and complaining that they didn't practice hard enough. So you get points for that, right? That also kind of goes against you because Nick Saban and his staff are so good at maximizing these players. So if I'm watching a kid coming out of Texas, you can usually say, okay, I can get him a little bit stronger. We can fix that technique a little bit, and he has a little more upside. I think with Alabama kids, that upside isn't as great because they've been so well coached. They've been in a pro-style strength and nutrition program. So when you look at, you know, Ruben Foster coming out, he might not have the upside of some of these other inside linebackers, but you also don't have the the floor with him isn't real low. Like, you know you're getting a pretty dang good player day one, so maybe he doesn't have the athletic upside probably had a couple more surgeries than some of the other guys because he's really been grinded on and pounded on a little bit. But you know you're getting professional football players when you draft guys to Alabama. 